According to different perspectives and peoples and cultures and times, etc., these knights were shown drawn the, uh, they were drawn fighting phanazoids. Citizens are also urged to lock and barricade all doors, windows, and any other point of entry. Riots nationwide are prompting local governments to declare martial law. Phantazoids, travelers of the fractalverse. A phantazoid, essentially, is a creature that enters into a higher or lower cosmic realm. So, simply put, what do I mean by that? I mean that we don't live in a universe, okay? We live in something that I call the fractalverse, okay? It's infinite and it continues to loop. It just folds in on itself infinitely, okay? So, there are those realms above us, which we call the macrocosm, the bigger cosmic world, the bigger universe, okay? And then there is the microcosm, which we need to specialize the equipment in order to even see little glimpses of it because it's so tiny. That's the microcosm and the macrocosm. Phantazoids are travelers, that they, they, they travel between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Now, we're going to talk about the phantazoids because it's absolutely detrimental, I believe, when it comes to talking about the plasma apocalypse. For those of you who don't know, please stop and go watch my video about the plasma apocalypse. I have an entire playlist full of videos talking all about it. Today we're focusing on the phantazoids entering into our world or the great beasts of old, the fantastic beasts, the great monsters, you know, um, that we all know that we have ingrained in our memory, in our collective subconscious um, from just echoes of a distant past, of something powerful but short powerful but short-lived that had happened, that we had experienced that was completely outside of uh, the realm of what we consider to be normal or uh, local in our world, all right? So here's what basically happens. Uh, during the plasma apocalypse, a hole in our sky opens up, which basically becomes a doorway between our world and whatever is on the outside of our world or our sky, all right? Now, on the outside, there are other beings out there. I'm not going to refer to them as aliens because the concept of aliens has, has, has just been rearranged so much. Uh, but some people will, will refer to the phantasoids. Some people think that they are aliens. Some people believe that they are, what do they call them? Uh, cryptids okay some people think that they're cryptids i'm gonna ex i'm gonna i'm gonna go over many of those things but just to help you out the hole in the sky will open up the plasma will come in our world will depressurize uh the electromagnetics of our world will hit a neutral point as the poles or the polarity of our world switches over and the lights will go out the sun's going to turn off all the worst parts of the book of Revelation, basically, are going to happen, as well as Ragnarok, as well as, uh, you know, the, um, the parts that, in the Bhagavad Gita, all the major world religions that talk about the end times, or, inversely, all the world's religions that talk about the very beginning of things, is going to occur. It's going to happen. So, here's what we're talking about. When that hole opens up, right now, no monsters can get in, we can't get out, nothing's coming and going. I think a lot of us have already sort of accepted that, right? Now we're wondering why. Well, there's a barrier above us. That's our sky. That's our ceiling to our world. Some people refer to it as the dome or the highest, hardest glass ceiling. A hole will open up in that as, 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 as does happen cyclically in the plasma apocalypse. When that happens, that means once everything shoots out because of the depressurization, um, that means that now those beings, those phantasoids, those creatures that live outside of our world that are completely alien to us down here in our microcosm, they are able to enter in. I don't know if they get pulled in, if they fall in, if they're just curious and so they come in. Maybe they're waiting. I don't know. Maybe there's a line and they can't wait to come in here. I don't know. Uh, but we are going to talk about them, okay? Now, the odds are very good that you've, many of you have probably seen these um, in the movies. They're portrayed all of the time, all right? And we're going to talk about the difference between what we call monsters and what phantasoids actually are. I'll get to the I'll get to that in a little bit. But basically, phantasoids, these are portrayed in our media, in our movies, in our television shows, uh, lots of commercials and stuff. They're basically these strange, super alien, weird-looking monsters uh, that I have termed the fog monsters. 
I mean, people probably call them that, but that's what I call them. I call them the mist monsters or the fog monsters. And the reason that I call them that is because they are almost always, when they're portrayed in like movies and stuff like that, there's almost always a scene in the movies where you know, the whole world is very misty or very foggy or that these creatures are sort of hiding inside of this foggy atmosphere, right? There's a lot of elements. The fog and the mist is one of those elements. The reason for that is very easy. The world, when a hole opens up, we live in a pressurized world. We have pressure systems in our world because it's pressurized, okay? It's contained. When the container opens, just like when you open up a soda, a soda or a pop, wherever you're from, uh, it all wants to come out. So the world depressurizes. The moment the world depressurizes, uh, what happens to the air, and I've shown videos of this, you can look it up, um, you know, in uh, airplanes. There's a lot of airplane, look up airplane depressurization or airplane cabin depressurization, and you'll see the moment that it's rapidly depressurized, the air itself turns into mist or fog. And if it's cold enough, it will turn into snow. Okay, so this is the main reason why you see on shows like Stranger Things. When Stranger Things, Stranger Things is showing you exactly what is to come, all right? Yes, they, they take some license and, you know, they, they, they cartoonify it and they glorify it and stuff and so that it looks, you know, more story form. But they're showing you, they're disclosing. All of these shows, these movies, they're all disclosing to you what is actually happening or what is actually going to come. Let me throw some pictures up on here. These are the fog monsters. These are the mist monsters, just like the movie The Mist, right? This is exactly what you can expect to see. Some people are not going to like this, that, oh, great, I have to survive the apocalypse. Then I have to battle great beasts and monsters and stuff. Oh, this, you know what I mean? I get very excited about it. I get very happy about it because that sounds great to me. I, I would love to be a part of that. I can't wait, you know, but that's what we're going to be talking about. The great beasts of old. These are the huge monsters. These are the, you know... The sea monsters, the beasts, the leviathan. We're going to talk more about those things. I'm just checking my notes here. Uh, another word for monster, and if you don't, if you haven't seen my other video already, go watch my space whales video. Space whales and other great beasts of old. But another word for monster is the word whale. They are synonymous with one another. That's going to be really important when we talk about biblical examples of the phantozoids entering into our world. Uh, one example I want to give you guys, this is the easiest example, if you can wrap your mind around a phantozoid, is you think about the tardigrade, okay? Many of you have seen the tardigrades. There's a tardigrade emoji. They're basically microscopic. The world's tiniest animals is what some people call them. They're also called water bears, all right? A lot of people think they're very cute, which is why they're very popular, but they're microscopic, but they're tiny, little, tiny, microscopic animals. Now, one of the most important things about the tardigrade that everyone seems to remember. One little factoid is that if I were to ask a hundred people, if there were a video game and I ask a hundred people, hey, what do you know about tardigrades? I promise like at, le at least a good majority, a good chunk of those 100 people would say, I don't know, can't they like survive space? Like, Can't they survive the extremities or like the vacuum of space? Or I promise that's something that other people are going to remember. They don't know how they remember it. They don't know why they remember it, but they can remember that tardigrades can survive space. Who cares? It's a microscopic little thing here on Earth. You know what I mean? That's been that's a little factoid that's been pounded into our uh, collective memories for a particular reason. Why do we associate tardigrades, microscopic little tiny animals here in our realm that live in the, our microcosm, with the greater macrocosm that is outside of our world, living out there in the macrocosm and basically being gigantic? The tardigrades have also quite frequently are portrayed as being huge and living out in space, basically being the size of Alice in Wonderland's caterpillar. Caterpillar, because I don't think that that is a caterpillar. I think it's a tardigrade or a space whale or a space monster, whatever you would like to call it. So yeah, the word monster is synonymous with whale. Tardigrades are a perfect example, okay? So if a tardigrade is out there and it's gigantic, out there it's normal sized, you know? But when it falls into our micro microcosm, then it becomes a huge monster, you know? These these beings, these creatures are going to fall down into our world. They're going to be outside of their element. They're not going to know what to like eat. They're not going to know where to go, how to survive, what to live. They'll probably be disoriented, you know? Um, 
they're going to be going through a lot of things. Now, I just want to give you good news from the beginning. Okay. This is not something that you're going to have to worry about for a very long time. This is not something that's going to just go on for years and years and years. And, you know, your family for generations are all going to have to fight the Phanazoids or watch out for them. I don't believe that's going to happen uh, for that long, but we're going to talk about that uh, a little later as well. This concept of the Phanazoid monsters coming down into our world, entering into our world during the cyclical plasma apocalypse, this concept is where we get uh, fighting the dragons of old, right? When we talk, you know, when you think about like uh, George and the dragon, like George fighting the dragon or the patron saint, right? Um, or the various other, like there's a, there's this fighting the dragon symbolism all over the place. Why would you want to fight a dragon? They're supposed to be like wise and, you know, like live for a very long time, etc. But this is where this comes from. This comes from an era in our history, ancient history, where Men had to fight beasts. Men had to fight the great dragons, the great beasts of old. Essentially, the phantazoids that have fallen into this realm, they're paranoid, they're hungry, you know, they're looking to make homes for themselves as well. This is something that we remember collectively was fighting against the monsters, fighting the dragons. Um, this is also like Ragnarok uh, at the end of the world when all everything comes back together, okay? Everything's been dispersed. There are no more giants. There are no more titans. There are no more monsters, etc. Ragnarok says when the end of the world comes or when the beginning of the next one comes, all of those creatures, all of those fantastic beasts and, and amazing different creatures of, of existence, they all return. The gods come back. The giants come back. The titans come back. The phanazoids come back. And we're all in it together for a, a small amount of time. Uh, I do want to throw this out there. The phantazoids not only, I believe, come from the hole that opens up in our sky, but as well, they come from down below. They come up from the ground. Because remember this, there is a realm above us and there is a realm below us as well. All right. Um, various cultures, different religions have talked about the realms that exist above and below us. However, they have also talked about the barriers that are in place to keep people from going from one world to another, you know, to keep creatures out basically and to keep people safe. All right. There's a separation. However, every once in a while, those barriers come down. Those separators are uh, open. There's a door, there's a portal that opens up essentially. And it's because of the electromagnetics that basically sort of shut off for a while in our world. Uh, but those electromagnetics are what keep those barriers up and running. There are literally fields of, of a force that is keeping things separated. They're force fields. All right. And one of those force fields is around our world. It's keeping out the ones that are above us. All right. And, and around us, I should say. Um, there's also a barrier that keeps them down those ones that live in the, what we would call the inner earth, it keeps them down there too. They can't get up and out, or at least it's not very easy, I would say, okay? Um, but I just want to throw that out there. Phanazoids can come from the sky, they can fall down into our world, and they can also come up from the ground uh, itself. And yes, there's going to be a lot of stuff, okay? Like, I can be very excited about it because I feel like I was born for this. I feel like I'm ready for this particular moment in history. Some of this stuff might scare some, you know, some of you out there. I don't know what to tell you. Why would you be scared? Like the inevitable is the inevitable. You might as well go out with your head held high, you know, saying that you fought the dragon. That's, that's what I'm going to do. But anyhow, so this is the fighting the dragon. They can come from underground or above, you know, beyond the dome. And they are typically gray. Like this is what they look like typically. Okay. They're typically... Uh, like a grayish kind of very bland or a white color or very little color to them, but they do typically have this sort of a shiny uh, glow, like not, not a glow, but a, a sort of a, a slimy shine to them. Okay. Um, now you might be asking, where do you get this information? Like, have you seen a phantasoid, right? Um, so I'm just going to throw this out there right now because I know people are going to ask me, they ask me all the time. I get this information from the aether around us, from the energy that we all share, from my gut, from my imagination, from my experience in life, okay? Yes, from movies, absolutely, you know? I want to talk about that real quick, all right? Since I mentioned movies, none of these movies that you're seeing over here, none of them start off by saying, um, caution, this is completely made up. 
none of this is actually real. They don't start off by saying that. You assume that it's not real because it's so fantastic. It can't possibly be real, right? It doesn't look normal like when I leave the movie theater, you know? That does not mean that it's not real. There's one story, one story, that can only be told, that has ever been told. We just tell that story from different points in the timeline, from different Geogra uh, geographic regions from different cultures and perspectives. Okay. There's only one story. So there is no such thing as complete fantasy, complete fiction and stuff that's just made up. I'm not even sure at this point if it's even possible to make something up that, that doesn't have some substance to it, that doesn't have some truth building it and keeping it together. You know what I mean? Anyhow, I digress. Let's get back on track. You know, they don't have a sun the way we do. They don't have light the way that we do. They, their body is going to change. You know what I mean? But this is how they're portrayed. Uh, let's see. So they're typically gray, white looking, uh, very little color. Or if they do have color, they're very reflective, like a bubble. You know, like when you look at a bubble, it's got like the sort of rainbow colors that are all mixed into it. Um, or if you see like an oil spill on the ground, you can sort of see that rainbow shine that it has to it, which also is, by the way, directly related to Stephen King's The Shine or The Shining that uh, Stephen King's, many of his characters have. When they start developing these paranormal abilities, is they say that they have The Shine. That's because these beings have The Shine. This is something that we used to have was a shine, okay? We used to have this shine to us, which came along with these paranormal abilities, okay, which we'll talk about as well. Let me talk about the types and the classes of phantasoids, all right? So I've been studying the phantasoids for quite some time. I've developed a tentative list of types, phantasoid types, and phantasoid classes. There's three main types from what I can tell. There are simply the friendlies, the neutrals, and the eaters, all right? The friendly types, those are the types that you could probably, you know, walk up and ride or, you know, help or t talk to or whatever it may be. They're friendly, right? Now, I'm going to talk about, you know, whether or not you should just walk up to your local phantasoid and start petting it and stuff a little bit towards the end. There's the neutrals. The neutrals don't really like, you know, they don't really care if they eat you or not. They're very neutral. They don't, they don't see human uh, human beings as like, you know, something special, but they don't see us as enemies as well. Basically, if you piss off the neutrals, then they can become your enemies. It, you know, they're neutral. It's very simple. And then there's the eaters. The eaters are, that's self-explanatory. They eat. They're, they're here to go hunt. Okay. They're the hunters, basically. Um, I don't know if they're eaters. Maybe we should call them hunters. All right. But those are the three types, friendlies, neutrals, and eaters or hunters. All right. Now the three, the classes, there's five different classes that I've got for the Phantasoids so far. The first class is the bug class. You will see, just like in the movies here, when you see these types of creatures, okay, a lot of times they can come across as looking very insect-like. These, this is where we get, I'm convinced, all right? This is where we get the insectoid alien race. There is a reason why millions and millions of people over the past at least 50 years have all been talking about the very real reality that there is an alien race of beings that are like bugs, okay? These are them. The phantasoids are the, there's a, there's a class that I call the bug class, okay? And a subclass, okay, a little subclass from the bugs are the locust class. The locusts are the hunters or the eaters of the bug class, all right? These, that's a bug, that's a locust right there. When you see the aliens, you know, all those creepy ones, especially the aliens, whenever they, they draw them, like looking like grasshoppers, or they always have like these external, they have an exoskeleton, that's, that's one of the uh, defining characteristics of the bug class. They almost always have an exoskeleton um, and, you know, typically like they, they'll look a little bit like a, a locust or a grasshopper or a cricket or an ant or things of that nature, okay? So there's the bug class with the subclass of the locusts. Uh, there's the kaiju class. The kaiju are the giant uh, phantasoids that enter into our world. They're just enormous. They're just way bigger than buildings. You know, I, I don't, I don't have like a, 
a scale to put on it, but they're basically akin to giants and titans, except they're phantazoids, all right? They're huge. Now, when the kaiju fall into our world, typically, I'm assuming that they're probably disoriented, you know, that they're like not knowing where to go. Mankind is probably going to shoot at them. This is basically where you get Godzilla. This is where you get your kaiju. This is where you get all your larger than life, slow motion moving beings that are just giants and moving everywhere. Well, I don't know if they're trying to just kill everyone or wipe out cities or whatever. They're probably trying to figure out, whoa, where am I? What's going on? Like, why? What? What's stinging me? What, what are all these little beings that are shooting at me, you know? Um, I'm not defending them, okay? They could be malevolent. They could be, uh, you know, benevolent. But like I said, there's three classes, right? Friendlies, neutrals, and eaters or hunters. Okay, so we've got the bug class, the kaiju class. You've got the worm class, W-Y-R-M. Or you could spell it the other way. But it's the worms, the worms. This would encompass the uh, microcosmic version of snails, turtles, and the sandworm-like creatures, okay? So it could be like this thing right here. This would be the worm class, all right? It's not a bug. It's not the kaiju. Well, actually, that would be a kaiju as well, huh? Anyways, I'm going to work on all the classes, okay? But just follow me. We got the bugs, the kaiju, which are the giant uh, phantasoids, the worms, which are like the sandworms, you know? Remember, I said that there are ones that come up out of the ground. And if you go watch my video called uh, Space Whales and Other Great Beasts of Old, you'll see that there are sandworms that exist in our reality here, okay? Who's to say there's not a huge, gigantic, titanic version of a sandworm or a graboid or, you know, these worm-like things that live down there in the inner world or at the bottoms of our oceans or whatnot, right? Uh, you've got your creature class or your creature... Uh, your chimera class, right? These are your animal-like kaiju. I mean, your animal-like um, um, phantasoids. This, the creature class is what you see on like uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Like that movie where you see like that part cat, part creature. These are the creatures that are the phantasoids. They've been described as the chimera. Um, a chimera is basically like an, an animal that's an amalgam of various animals, okay? It's different animals that are all stuck together in one animal. That's like a chimera. So that's what people saw. They saw the, they saw the, the creature class of the phantasoids, and they didn't know what they were, so they just described it as best as they could. Uh, it kind of looks like a, a horse on the bottom with like a, a human on the top, you know, or it kind of looks like a lion, but it's also kind of looks like a... Uh, you know, a, a bird, etc. Th that's how they described these things because they didn't know what they were. They are completely and utterly alien to what we know today. So what we did with the Chimera or the creature class of the Phantasoids is we just gave them attributes of things that we already understand, things that we are already familiar with. Okay, so that's, those are the creature class. And then finally, you've got the bipedals. All right, the bipedals are just those uh, phantasoids that walk on two legs, just like you and I do, okay? Um, the bipedals, from my experience, typically, I assume, are the ones that are the sliders. Uh, the sliders are the space travelers. They are your start, they're, they're your Trekkies out there in what we call space, okay? Don't jump on me for your concept of space, all right? I have my own. All right. But anyhow, uh, whatever's out there, okay, there's something out there beyond our sky, beyond the skyline, right? Beyond skyline. That's, that's a movie that has all this stuff in it. All right. These are not just stories. They're not just made up. This is our story. The closer you look into the fantasy books and the sci-fi movies and all this stuff, the more you're learning about your own history, about your own story. Okay. Whether it be the very beginnings of that story or towards the end or, you know, where none of the actions really happening. So you focus in the middle on the relationships, you know, of the, of the people who are there, you know what I mean? It's just all one big story. All right, let's move on in color. They're very pale, you know, but with a sort of shiny sort of slimy look to them they're not slimy but they just sort of have this shiny slimy look you know which is interesting when you think about how the ancients used to anoint people with this you know particular oil of an alligator or a crocodile or something and they would call them the shining one or the christ and they would shine just like these beings right there are yeah. many cultures and religions throughout history uh that have had some sort of a sacred animal 
And typically, this sacred animal is a herald. It's a harbinger of the end times or heaven returning or, you know, the world starting over. And these people have said that when they, when they witness the birth of their sacred white animal, that, you know, that, that they know that, uh, you know, that their saviors are coming back, that the gods are coming back, or that time is going to get a lot better. Things are in for a huge change, right? And there have been all these various animals born white because this happens in our world, right? But are all of these religions and these uh, cultures, are they talking about albino animals that just happen to be born on occasion every once in a while as is natural in the world? Or are the stories themselves that talk about these pure white animals, these sort of, not, not albino, okay? Because the albino would have the red eyes. As you can see here, these got like blue eyes, right? Uh, but these pure white animals that come down from the heavens quite often, is that, is that what they're talking about? Are, are the Sioux, uh, you know, the natives here in America, um, are they talking about an actual flying buffalo, like a buffalo that just flew down? You know what I mean? No, of course they're not. Buffaloes don't fly. We know this, you know? So yes, we can go along with like a flying buffalo and then it turns into a lady or whatever. But in reality, it is the phantasoids that come down into the world and they come down into the world right along with the helpers or the watchers or the gods or the angels or whatever you want to like to see them as. Okay. I know titles are a tough thing with people. But these are your sacred white animals from the various cultures. There are different types of phantasoids in the world. Let me go back to the live scene here. There are different types, as we already discussed, and there have been lots of different names for them. The most common name that I found is just monster. Okay, monster really covers it. Monster is something you don't know. You don't know what it is. It's it's that alien. It's that different that you don't even know how to describe it. Uh, but they've also gone by some of these other names here. They've gone by the title, the Leviathan. That's biblical, right? And the behemoth, the Leviathan, the behemoth, the Yamim, the Kifa, the Dekifat, uh, and of course, the Revelation locusts, which I'm going to talk to you about right now. Let's get into all of these, okay? Some of this is going to be more biblical, but keep, please keep in mind that happens to be my area of expertise. Uh, there are other religions and other cultures that share the exact same stories. I'm relying upon many of you out there to help share that information down below in the comments section. All right, so let's get back to some of the names here. Let's start off with the popular Leviathan and the Behemoth from uh, the book of Job in the book of Revelation. All right, so this is from the book of Job, chapter 40. And Job is talking to his God. And his God says, Look at Behemoth, which I have made along with you. He feeds on grass like an ox. See the strength of his loins and the power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar, which is a giant tree, right? Uh, the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are rods of iron. Okay, he is the foremost of God's works, means one of the first creatures to be made. Only his maker can draw the sword against him. The hills yield him their produce, while all the beasts of the field play nearby. He lies under the lotus plants, hidden among the reeds of the marsh. The lotus plants conceal him in their shade, the willows of the brook surround him. Though the river rages, Behemoth is unafraid. He remains secure, though the Jordan, the river Jordan, surges to his mouth. Can anyone capture him as he looks on or pierce his nose with a snare? This is a huge part of the Bible. A lot of biblical scholars will talk about the behemoth. People, you know, argue back and forth about what it possibly is. Some people think that the Leviathan and the behemoth are dinosaurs being described, okay? There's a lot of good evidence that says they're not dinosaurs as we know them, as we have been taught. Um, and some people have even speculated that it might be talking about a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros. All of those things can all be thrown out the window because they don't exactly match the description that's being given here, okay? The description of what's being described, for me, this is a kaiju phantasoid. This is a, uh, a friendly type or at least neutral type, uh, kaiju class phantasoid. That's what it's talking about. The phantasoids have this exoskeletal armor, okay? And that's why the tardigrade, the microscopic tardigrade can survive the extremes of the vacuum of space or whatnot. It's got a, a seal on it, okay? It doesn't have uh, skin how we do. It's got an exoskeletal frame to it, all right? And this is why God in the Bible is talking to Job and he's saying, Psh, nobody can even pierce this thing's armor. It can't pierce its hide. Its, its skin is like metal. 
And that's exactly how the phantasoids are shown when they're on the movies and stuff. Like typically their claws and stuff can rip through all sorts of things. Now, this is directly relevant to the knights of old, the medieval knights. I'm going to talk about those in a bit. Let's move on to the Leviathan in the Bible, right? Same book, Job chapter 41. God's power is shown in the Leviathan. So God goes on and says, can you pull in the Leviathan with a hook? Can you tie its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will he beg you for mercy or speak to you softly? Let me jump in real quick, okay? This is all rhetorical questions, right? The answer is no, hell no, of course not. You know, it's, it's, it's talking about the great beasts of old. That's how, um, that's how gigantic and fantastic they were. Let's move on. Let's read on. Can you pet him like a bird? Can you put a leash on him for your maidens? Will traders barter for him? Or will you divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill the Leviathan's hide with harpoons? Or his head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the battle. And you will never repeat it. This is not talking about anything in our terrestrial known world today. This is absolutely talking about some sort of phantasoid that has existed and survived to that particular part, you know, portion of time. Now remember, when this all starts off, the phantasoids flood in. They are the flood, if you have ever played the game Halo, okay? The phantasoids are the flood. They flood into our world. They, they're here. There's lots of them everywhere. However, they're only here for a short amount of time, okay? So after a while, okay, say a few months, they start dying out, okay? They're, remember, they're outside of their element. They don't know what to eat. They're starving to, get to death. Who knows? You know, they, they don't know where to find stuff. They're, they are outside of their natural environment. They're not going to survive for very long. The ones that do survive become legend. Like, they become, like, people know where they live. They know where to find them. They say, stay away from this area. They're the legendary monsters. So let's, let's finish reading about the Leviathan here in the Bible. Uh, surely hope of overcoming him is false. Is not the sight of him overwhelming? I mean, look at the, the phantasoids that are in the movies, like the Predator or Alien, the movie Alien. Those are locust class phantasoids, as well as uh, A Quiet Place, which I'm actually going to talk about A Quiet Place in detail here in a bit. All right. No one is ferocious enough to rouse the Leviathan. Okay. It's like, it's a pretty blanket statement by God, right? Um, uh, no one is ferocious enough to rouse the Leviathan. Then who is able to stand against me? Then he goes on. Uh, I cannot keep silent about his limbs, his power, his graceful form. Who can strip off his outer coat? Now, the outer coat is not skin. It's not fur. It's not this or that. No, he's talking about the exoskeletal structure of the phantasoids. Okay. Who can strip off his outer coat? Who can approach him with a bridle? Meaning to tame the phantasoid. By the way, I want to throw this out there. I absolutely believe that there is, there is, there is evidence out there that suggests that the phantasoids, some of them may actually be able to work with humanity. Some of them might be tame. Some of them might be friendly. You know, there's a friendly class, but clearly not the one, not the Leviathan. That's what God is saying, right? Uh, so he goes on to say, who can open his jaws ringed by his fearsome teeth? A jaw that is ringed with fearsome teeth. This is exactly how the phantasoid class, some of these phantasoids always have faces that open up. You know what I mean? When you watch the movies or the TV shows, when they show these monsters or these really creepy, you know, aliens or whatever, their faces tend to like break apart and open up. Well, guess what? So does ours. Okay. This is called a mouth. It, this is a part of my face. It opens up. Now it's very limited. You know, we're used to how it looks and stuff, but the face of, of particular phantasoids, uh, specifically and typically the, uh, locust class of the bug race. Okay. Of the bug class, the locusts of the bug class, they typically have faces that open up. This is nothing new. If you look at the microscopic animals that exist in our world, you can see that many of them have faces that actually open up and they just, you know, they suck things right in and they've got all these little razor sharp teeth that just kind of help it to go into the throat and stuff. This is describing the phantasoids. All right, let's finish this up. Let's see here. His rows of scales are his pride tightly sealed together. Okay. It's not talking about a reptilian. Uh, yes, you could, I'm sure reptilian was, was an attribute that was given when people tried to describe these weird things, right? But that's the closest thing they could think of was scales, armor, something tough, something strong, impenetrable, okay? These are, these are beasts and animals that people wouldn't even think of, like just fighting by themselves, you know, that, that there was a good chance that they could just kill or go hunt these things, right? But they did. They would form parties, they would go out, uh, and people made a name for themselves by killing the phantasoids, okay? That became, you know, a title that a person could get. But... Let's see here. One scale is so close to another that no air can pass between them. They are joined to one another. They clasp and they cannot be separated. His snorting flashes with light and his eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth. Fiery sparks shoot forth. Let's stop. Time out. I got to call time out. Why? Because we're talking about what we think of whenever we talk about dragons, right? Fire breathing monsters. Most people would say, oh, I don't know about, I, I, you know, nothing breathes fire in our world, so that has to not be real. That has to not exist, right? Absolutely wrong. There could be a creature from another world that breathes in a different way than we do, right? Or, you know, it 
stuff goes in and out of its body, you have no idea what the chemical composition is and how it changes when it goes from what it is normal, right? It's its own realm and it falls down into this realm where our living conditions and our atmosphere are pro most likely a lot different, right? So yes, absolutely. You could have some sort of chemicals inside of these, some of these great beasts that produce some sort of a smoke, right? Some sort of a sulfur or something that comes out and you would see like smoke coming out of their mouth. Maybe when they exhale due to the shape, remember how it just called its mouth circular? Maybe due to its shape, when it does breathe out, it actually shoots out little smoke rings. How you see on Alice in Wonderland when she's talking to the caterpillar, right? Which is the tardigrade up on its mushroom talking about one side makes you bigger, the other side makes you smaller. That is the microcosm and the macrocosm uh, that the caterpillar is talking about. And he's one to know because he's a space whale. He's a tardigrade. He's a, he is a traveler of the fractal verse. He knows all about it. But anyway, yeah, this is what it's talking about. The Bible is saying fire breathing monsters exist. Oh, it's not metaphorical. It's not symbolic. It's not, it's not telling a story that's just entertaining. It's, it's no, it's talking about fire breathing monsters from a time, from a land before time. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Smoke billows from his nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames pour out of his mouth. Strength resides in his neck and dismay leaps before him. The folds of his flesh are tightly joined. They are firm and immovable. His chest is hard as a rock. Where was I? Uh, when the Leviathan rises up, the mighty are terrified. They withdraw before his thrashing. The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear or dart or arrow. He regards iron as straw and bronze like rotten wood. Basically, these these monsters, these uh, phantasoids, can bend metal. That's how strong they are. Like I said, they have an exoskeletal structure. They are very, very strong, okay? Um, as well as being very, very large and heavy, probably. A club is regarded like straw, and he laughs at the sound of the lance. Laughs at the sound of the lance. Remember that one, too, because we're going to talk about uh, why in medieval art they have these uh, knights with their lances trying to fight snails for some reason, right? I think a lot of you already know why. His undersides are jagged like potsherds, spreading out like the mug, like a threshing sledge. He makes the depths seed like a cauldron. He makes the sea like a jar of ointment. Uh, he leaves a, glist a glistening wake behind him. One would think that the deep had white hair. That's interesting. It's saying that the Phanazoids have white hair, right? So some sort of hairy-like thing on the Phanazoid itself, and it's being described as white. Exactly how I was just talking about, right? The Phanazoids are that grayish, dull, white, slimy uh, color that sort of gives a little shiny rainbow effect to it, right? Nothing on earth is his equal. A creature devoid of fear. So nothing on earth is his equal, which means by extension that he must have equals that are not on earth. This is an alien. This is an alien being. This is something that does not belong here. Nothing on earth is its equal, right? He looks down on all the haughty, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So that was the Leviathan in the Bible. Basically the behemoth, behemoth, however you want to pronounce it, and the Leviathan are both phantasoids. Okay. Now let's move on to the last biblical example. All right. Which is probably the most relevant, which is Revelation 9 and the locusts of Revelation 9. Like I said, there are these different classes of phantasoid. Uh, I have named one of them. A subsection of the bug class is the locust class. That's exactly what the, the book of Revelation talks about when it talks about the end times. I'm going to read this here. The fifth trumpet. All right. Now this is very interesting. Before I read this, remember, we're reading a part of the story. There's only one story that can ever be told. What we're about to read right now is at the very beginning, or you could say the very end of the story. We're going to say it's the very end of the story. It just happens at the very end of the story, according to the biblical narrative, um, that when the fifth trumpet sounds, that these phanazoids, these locusts, these monsters, come up out of the ground and enter into our world, right? Coincidentally enough, if you go to the very beginning of the Bible, on day number five, there's the five again that's, you know, pops up with the mention of the phantasoids. On day five, guess what was made? Before mankind and all that. Great monsters. That is the original word that was used. If you read it in your Bible, if you have one, uh, most likely the modern translations will, they put the word whale in there. God made whales on the fifth day. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I'm sorry. He made monsters. That's the original word that was used. Uh, the translators of the Bible, they didn't like the word monster for some reason. So they took it right out. They put in the word whale. Okay. That's why I did a video about the space whales, AKA the monsters that are outside of our, our realm. All right. So but let's read about the, uh, the locusts that come in the end times, the fifth trumpet. 
And then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to the earth, and it was given the key to the pit of the abyss. Now, when it's talking about the pit and the abyss of the earth, our realm, uh, middle earth, I should say, our, of our realm, it's talking about the inner earth. It's talking about what lies in the middle of our earth, okay? And there is a key to the abyss. Remember, that abyss is locked right now. Those separators between us and the world above and us and Lalotai or the realm of the monsters below, that's locked. There is a barrier. There's a force field keeping people out, basically, okay? But somebody or something is given the keys to the abyss, the lower world, during this plasma apocalypse. And like I said, those barriers are turned off. The doors are opened. The portals are open. You know, you can go back and forth between worlds. Sorry, that was just my commentary. Let's go continue reading. And it, now I like this, it was given the key. Remember what I told you guys it was? It was given the key to the pit of the bottomless of, of the abyss, sorry. The star opened the pit of the abyss and smoke rose out of it like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the pit. Now, you could call that smoke or you could call that the air depressurizing and turning instantly into fog and steam and, you know, mist and stuff like that. You could say that. Which, by the way, is exactly how it's described in the book of Genesis. When you read in the book of Genesis, it says there, there were no great oceans all over the place. It says that God caused a mist to rise up from the ground to water everything. Even in the beginning, there was this mist in correlation with the great whales or monsters of old. Just like in the end, there is this smoke in correlation with these phantasoid monsters that come up from the ground. All right, continue reading. And out of the smoke, locusts descended on the earth, and they were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any plant or tree. Basically, these are not herbivores. They don't eat plants. But only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts were not uh, given power to kill them, but only torment them for five months. And their torment, there's the five again, right? And their torment was like the stinging of a scorpion. In these days, men will seek death and they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. So here we've got some sort of predator class, the hunter class of phantasoids that go around not to eat people, as has been portrayed in many movies where, you know, the phantasoids are just there to kind of you know, that's what we're afraid of. We've been, we've been conditioned to be afraid of being eaten, okay? These things are not here to eat. They're not here to feast, okay? I'm not saying they do or they don't, but that's what the Bible's saying. Now, what they're here to do is they're here to attack. They're on a seek and destroy mission. They're, they're here to go bite people, to go infect, to go sting, or whatever you would want, like to call it, okay? Interestingly enough, here's the movie, okay, A Quiet Place. This is just a still from the actual movie. As you can see, this guy in, in the background, he's been doing his research, okay, which is critical. What we're doing right now is doing our research. That's what we're doing. We're not just mindlessly being entertained about, oh, monsters could be real. How awesome is that? Yes, we're kind of doing that. But at the same time, we are also researching. We are doing exactly what this guy in the movie is doing right now. We're learning about what is to come. We're getting prepared, all of these things. Now, over here, you know, there's all this uh, newspaper clippings and stuff. He has a whiteboard, which I like, right? Uh, he's got a whiteboard and he's got all his notes up there. On the left-hand side, it says creature. The creature is blind. They attack sound. They have armor. Do you see that? Armor is written in blue there and underlined, okay? Exactly how the phantasoids I've been describing are. They have an exoskeleton. They have armor. Um, but I want to go over for just a second. I don't want to show you something else. This is from the actual movie, right? But this right here, this is a clip from the preview. Now, I, I went through the whole movie a couple times. I didn't see this. This is different. So they changed the whiteboard from the preview to the release of the actual movie. So what I'm saying is this was not in the movie. Now, in the preview, he has down here at the bottom, why don't they eat their kill? The word eat is hidden here, but it says, why don't they eat their kill, right? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's, oh, look at that. See? See how the number five is there? 
right? The number five, once again, associated with the monsters or the phanazoids, okay? Uh, the large beasts of old or whatever. Why don't they eat their kill? Why am I showing you that? Because we're talking about the revelation locusts that do not enter into this world in order to eat. That's not their, their primary goal is not to eat people. Their primary goal is to, to infect, to sting. Okay. Exactly how it is in this movie. In this movie, they're, they don't, they don't go around eating. They're just going around to kill people because they have some sort of a purpose, right? But anyway, uh, that's, that's in the quiet place. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to a quiet place here in just a minute after we finish with the revelation locust. Verse seven. And the locusts looked like horses that were prepared for battle means they were wearing armor with something like crowns of gold on their heads, right? Some sort of horns. A uh, crown just means horn. For those of you who don't know, the word crown is the same word as Corona, same way, same word as corn, same word as horn. All of these words are the same thing. They mean horns. Okay. So they have, uh, these crowns or these horns on their head faces like the faces of men. They had hair like that of women. You remember Leviathan was described as having white hair, right? And teeth like those of lions. You see how they're taking all these different animals and, and beings and creatures and they're sticking them together? That's a chimera class phanazoid. They also had thoraxes. If you have a thorax, that indicates you're a bug class, okay? Like you are a phanazoid of some sort if, if this is you. They had thoraxes like the breastplates of iron. Then the sound of their wings was like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. So these ones actually have wings. So it's very likely that some of the phanazoids can fly. All right. Um, just like in uh, Batman versus Superman. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but Batman does not like Superman. And he has this really bad dream or premonition about Superman. Basically in the future, the Superman ha takes over the world and he has these little flying phanazoid type bipeds, uh, bipedal phanazoids um, that are his helpers. They're like, they look like mosquitoes or, you know, locusts basically. They were ruled by a king, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon, you know, and they're always there. They're there at the beginning and they're there at the end. And they're only here for a short time. Like the Bible says, they're only allowed to go around tormenting people for five months. The fifth trumpet sounded on the fifth day. God made the, uh, the great beasts of old, the great monsters of old, etc. You've got the number five right there as well. So anyhow, yeah, that's, that's the biblical examples of the phantasoids. Now, I want to talk about a couple of other examples of phantasoids, possible ones, that we have, uh, I'm not going to actually, I don't know, should I share this? Let's see. All right, so the mysterious creatures from the book of Joshua are found on a Mayan stella. This is the Mayan stella right here. It's basically a rock carving, okay? Look at this thing. It has the head of like a bear, the body of a man, and then it's got these sort of tail-like things coming down from its head, uh, sort of tube-like or rope-like or something like that. Now, I'm going to read. The, I've read this before. This is from the book of Joshua. It's not in the Bible, but it used to be considered a part of, you know, historical sacred texts or whatnot. And it can definitely be found in the book of Joshua, chapter 36, verses 28 through 35. This was Anah who found the Yamim in the wilderness when he fed the asses or donkeys of Zibion, his father. Whilst he was feeding his father's asses, he led them to the wilderness at different times to feed them. And there was a day that he brought them to one of the deserts on the seashore opposite the wilderness of the people. And whilst he was feeding them, behold, a very heavy storm came from the other side of the sea and rested upon the asses that were feeding there, and they all stood still. Afterward, about a hundred and twenty great and terrible animals." about 120 great and terrible animals. That means scary and gigantic. These are phantasoids. Came out from the wilderness at the other side of the sea, and they all came to the place where the asses were, and they placed themselves there. And those animals from their middle downward were the shape of the children of men. From their middle upward, some had the likeness of bears, some the likeness of kifas, with tails behind them from between their shoulders reaching down to the earth, like the tails of the decupat. 
And these animals came and mounted and rode on the asses, and they led them away, and they went away until this day. The rest of the story basically goes that the people were terrified. They never went back to that place ever again, and it was very like... People warned, you know, don't go to that place that's haunted or, you know, there's these scary animals or there's a legend of something that happened. That's what that was. That was such an important event of something out of the ordinary that they wrote that down. And it is mentioned in the Bible. OK, that that story is uh, actually mentioned in I think it's the book of Genesis. <clears throat> but anyhow, there were two other animals named there. Let me go back to my life, my live screen here. There were two other animals named there, okay? We, we already talked about the Leviathan and the Behemoth. In the book of Joshua, it mentions the Yemim. Now, scholars don't know what these words mean, okay? You can look it up. People will just have guesses, all right? The word Yem literally means ocean or sea, okay? Yemim means basically it conveys creatures from the ocean or those from the sea, those from the waters, okay? That's the great waters, that's what that's implying. Now, if they're the monsters from the great waters, well, those are the great waters above us. And those monsters fall through the great waters during the plasma apocalypse and they enter into our world. Okay. And those are the same great waters. That's why you have the mirror symbolism. All right. The reason that people are always walking through a mirror in order to get to some crazy, wonderful, strange world is because the mirror are the waters above us. The ocean waters, they act, they have a reflection just like a mirror. You can pass right through the waters and during the plasma apocalypse, whenever the portals or the windows of heaven open, you can get out or you can come in, you know, vice versa. Same thing with underneath us, like here, Lalotai in Disney's uh, Moana. Lalotai, you go through the waters again and you enter into another fantastic realm. Same thing. All right. Let's see, where was I? <clears throat> oh, that's right. We were talking about Yemim. So basically, Yemim means creatures from the great waters. Then you have another strange word, which is the Kifa. Well, Kifa is basically another word for rock, okay? Or Kefa. It depends on how you pronounce it. But it's the same exact word. It means rock or rock-like or stone, something to that nature. So the, here we have another reference to these monsters being to having described as having like a stone-like type of body, like made of rock, basically. They don't have skin how you and I do. They have exoskeletons, right? Okay, I can st probably stop doing that now. Um, and then the last word that was used was the uh, D-U-C-H-E-E-P-H-A-T, Dukipat or Dukifat. That's how you would read it, all right? But I don't believe that that's all one word. I believe those are three words. The D at the front in the ancient Phoenician or Hebrew language means of or from, essentially, okay? Then you have the same exact word, the kifa, which is spelled a little different, but it's still kifa. The de, kifa, and then ot, which is a, just a plural, okay? So it means, basically, the great sea creatures or the great creatures from this, the, the great waters, uh, the rock creatures or the rock-like creatures, and then those who are from the rock-like creatures, which are the Dukifat or the Dukifaot, okay? Those are, the, they're the offspring. They're their babies, basically. And that's, that's just one example. That, that's from the book of Joshua. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to knights fighting snails. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, there's going to be some pictures in the slideshow here, hopefully, but uh, there are thousands and thousands of images from medieval times that show like, you know, when people would write out a parchment, a scroll or whatever, they would draw little pictures on it. They have all these hundreds of pictures of knights, med medieval knights fighting snails, like their lances are trying to ram right through the, the shell of the snail. Why? Why would that be? You know, and I've heard a couple of, I've heard some really interesting theories on that. Some really interesting theories. But here's mine. Here's my take on it, right? The reason that you have all these knights that are dressed up fighting these snails is not because of what mainstream academia tells us or totally guess, guesses. And they, they basically say that the snails, oh, that's metaphor, that's, uh, that's a metaphor, you know? That's, they're symbolic of certain people that they didn't like. So they drew them like snails or whatever. I don't buy that. I don't know if you guys do or not. I don't buy that. I don't, I don't buy that the, the knights were drawn sh fighting snails because it was some sort of ancient tr way of trolling families that you didn't like. All right. The knights were fighting gigantic snails because they were fighting the phantasoids, 
which were drawn in different ways, uh, according to different perspectives and peoples and cultures and times, etc. These knights were shown drawn the, uh, dr they were drawn fighting phenozoids, gigantic snails. Well, we know gigantic snails don't really exist. And if they did, why would a knight need to fight one? Why would you need a knight to fight a snail? Of course it wouldn't. You just poke right through its shell and it'd be dead, right? No, these are the phantozoids that the knights are fighting. And the knights are the ones that fought the phantozoids. That's why we had knights. You don't have knights. Think about it. We've got these knights, these men, these human beings, allegedly, that were dressed up in all this huge, heavy, bulky armor, you know, and they would come out. And Have you ever seen people in the movies? They can barely even walk in this armor when they're trying to be like a knight or whatever. They're super heavy. It slows you down. This was not meant. This was not protection against human beings. This was not protection against terrestrial animals. The reason we had knights, I believe, during certain reset periods, one of them called the Middle Ages, is because these great men of renown, these heroes of old, they would get dressed up in, you know, the strongest, heaviest uh, substances, these metals, and they would go fight the Phantozoids. They would go kill the dragons. They're the ones that went and did that, and that's why we get through all these celebrations for the knights and stuff. It's not because the knights were like the main fighters in the army against the human beings, you know? No, absolutely not. The, the knights were the ones that went out, they killed the monsters, they killed the dragons or the phantozoids, and they had to wear all this huge, heavy, metallic armor because the phantozoids will just rip you to shreds. Otherwise, you know, that's, what, that's, that's why you have pictures of knights fighting snails all across the board. Do yourself a quick Google. I don't know if it's going to pop up in the, the slideshow there. These are all phantozoid examples. Uh, whether it be mist monsters or fog monsters or they're all phantozoid examples, okay? But yeah, go Google knights fighting snails and you can see, just click on images and there's hundreds of them. They're not doing that as an insult, as an insult to various families or whatever. No, they literally fought monsters, okay? They fought the phantozoids. All right, so those are the knights fighting the snails. I want to talk about this Netflix TV show called Love, Death, and robots. I think that's what it's called. Let me go ahead and get let me get it pulled up here and we'll do some more screen sharing. All right, so here we go. Love, death and robots. Whoa, whoa. It automatically plays. I have to be careful about that. All right, let's look at episodes. Now, I want to talk about this one first, all right? This this one has phantozoids in it, and I have paused it on this one particular scene, okay? I'm going to set the stage for you if you haven't seen this already. I highly advise watch this whole series, Love, Death, and Robots. Watch all of it, okay? This one right here, this is about these farmers that uh, have these special exoskeletal type, you know, weapons or whatever to fight the phantozoids, okay? Here's what happens. Here's what you're looking at. The farmers are in their little bio suits here, right? There's a hole that opens up in the sky. And I kid you not, every single one of these little dots right here, I'll play it for like a half a second. So all those tiny little dots, those are all moving. Those are all phantozoids that enter in through a hole in the sky and they come in and they try to like, you know, mess with everybody basically. This is absolutely how they're shown. Let me see if I can find a picture of one here. There we go. Jesus. Ah. Okay. So anyways, here's the picture of the phantozoid from Love, Death, and Robots, right? Uh, from that one particular episode titled Suits, okay? This is how they draw the phantozoid. This is exactly what I've been telling everyone this looks like. This is like clearly uh, a locust class bug, uh, bug class, right? A phantozoid. They're the ones that are on the prowl. They're the predators. They're the hunters. They've got all these rows of circular sharp teeth. They sort of have this exoskeletal type frame. I mean, this one right here is like a, a Fortnite version. Okay. This is like a very pretty cute, cutesy version of a phantozoid. All right. But this is how they're portrayed in, in that movie, right? Now, let me show you something else, okay? Like I showed you already, they come from the sky. When the hole opens up in the sky, there's also a giant one. See, this is a kaiju class uh, bug phantozoid right there. Boom. So let's go to the end. I want to show you the world of these people because it shows you their world. It zooms out from their world here at the end. Now, when it zooms out from the world, I'm going to see if I can get it here. 
When it zooms out, this whole world is underneath this dome, and all of these phantasoids are just scurrying around the dome trying to get in. And that's how it is uh, on here. Here's a picture of the dome here. And what looks like dust here are actually just millions of phantasoids all over the place. And I find that to be really interesting, right? So the, the dome of their world, their sky, opens up, and uh, all the phantasoids are just waiting to get in, basically. Uh, the first one you saw, Suits, you've got Beyond the Aquila Rift. I might as well just go ahead and jump in and show you this one, too. Spoiler alert, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you the episode, so don't watch it if you want to see it. All right, so in the movie, this guy wakes up in this other world. He was dreaming. This goes right along with the concept of the dream crabs that I talked about in... Uh, in my other videos, okay, uh, when I was talking about Starro being real and the dream crabs that come down in the, in the form of plasma, they cause us to go into this sort of dreamlike slumber, right? Well, this guy wakes up from his dreamlike slumber into the quote-unquote real world, and he is approached by a phantasoid that is actually a uh, shapeshifter that's trying to look like a human being. Let me see if I could find it. Oh, here we go. So this is the first scene... You see this chick that looks like, you know, she's going to walk right out of this cave or whatnot. But as she continues walking, okay, so she's this. This is what she turns into, okay? This is the creature that was pretending to be this hot chick in this dude's mind, right? This is a phantasoid. This, this fits the classic description, right? Look, it's got a circular mouth on the front of its face. Um, it's got all these different insect, you know, sort of an insect-like... Uh, uh, exoskeletal type type uh, structure to it. If you look closely, it almost looks like it even has like fine hairs on it. But it's got the circular mouth, just like we've been talking about, and it's got that sort of white, sort of ivory kind of creamish color, you know, shiny look to it, like it's slimy or something. Okay, so here is uh, an episode called The Dump. In uh, we're talking about Netflix's. Love, Death, and Robots, all right? This is the episode called The Dump. Basically, I can't really show it to you because it takes it's taking me forever to try to find the one frame that it has. But this whole episode takes place in this garbage world that this guy right here lives in, okay? This is a part of the plasma apocalypse. What happens is when everything gets sucked up, a lot of that trash, right, when, when it's all sealed off and the world is uh, pressurized and it's normal again, uh, that stuff will fall back down when the electromagnetic forces turn back on. All that stuff that hasn't escaped out of our world, it's going to come crashing right back down to the ground, which gives us our cargo cult a uh, new beginning world, a world where everything is basically the survivors walk around in the garbage of a leftover time, okay? And that's this guy. So in addition to the garbage world, you have the monsters that make a home inside of these piles of trash, okay? Um, this, the movie uh, Star Wars actually comes to mind. Uh, in the very beginning of Star Wars, Luke Skywalker and his buddies, they jump into the trash chute, and lo and behold, there's some sort of worm-like phantasoid monster with Luke Skywalker in the trash, okay? They're in the trash compactor. That's symbolic of the trash world, the garbage world that will be left behind when all that garbage falls down out of the sky, just like in uh, Thor Ragnarok. You know, when Thor goes to uh, that trash planet and all that trash is pouring down out of the portals up there, that's what that is. That's the end. That's the uh, the end of the, you know, the cyclical cataclysm. Everything falls back down to earth. Okay. Now there will be the monsters, aka the phantasoids. Some of them may or may not be hiding within these piles of just debris. Okay. That's what this whole episode is about. One of those phantasoids is hiding inside of this guy's dump, and it becomes his buddy. Okay. So this is a great one too. This is an episode called Fish Night. Basically, this guy and this other guy they get their car breaks down on the side of the road. Next thing you know, this kid sees all of these like ghostly apparitions of these monsters in the air, these sea creature monsters in the air, and he just starts floating. He he swims up into the air to be with these what are basically cartoon versions of phantasoids, okay? Um, which is, you know, if you follow the plasma apocalypse that I've been talking about, people are going to float. You'll float too. Everything's going to float, all right? Uh, that's why Pennywise says that. It's also why Pennywise is a pure white looking clown type creature because he represents the phantasoids, right? Um, 
which he he's basically a fanazoid. He's a shape shifting uh, fanazoid. But anyhow, in this in this episode, this kid goes up and he's swimming around in the air with the space whales and the monsters of old. Right? That's exactly what that's showing in this particular episode. And the last one, this one is going to be my favorite. So let's go back here. Let's click on this again. Go to episodes. All these are good. Every single one of these. This one is the this one's called Ice Age. This one's great. When I talk about the microcosm versus the macrocosm and the fractalverse that we live in, okay? These people look down into the microcosm world. It's it's amazing. All right, uh, let's see. The Secret War. That's what this one's called. The Secret War. Watch The Secret War if you want to know more. Do you see all this? Okay, so here's a clip from The Secret War. All right. Now, in The Secret War, everything kicks off. There's these soldiers, right? And everything gets very kind of foggy and cloudy, just as it's supposed to. And then the soldiers light up these flares. The flares just happen to turn the foggy atmosphere totally red, which is another thing that happens during the plasma apocalypse is the sky turns red. Right? Everything's very, uh, uh, like, you know, the colors of plasma, more of like a reddish, orangey, purplish kind of a color but typically a very red sky. And that's what you have is the red sky there. In the, out of the fog of the red sky, these phanazoids, insect-like predator uh, classes, right? I'm going to have to figure out my classes, but basically they're, uh, they're the bug class uh, eater types, the bug class hunter types, I should say, I, because I don't know if they eat them, but I, eater sounds good, right? Sounds scary enough that you want to stay away from it. So they are the... Uh, bug class or locust class eater types. Anyway, they're the they're the locust class eater types. Okay, and they come out of this fog and they start attacking all the soldiers. Okay, so here we have another clip, a still frame from the Secret War. You've got the Phantazoid right there in the middle. As you can see, it it's got everything that the Phantazoids are supposed to have. They're all drawn like this. This is coming from allegedly different people's imaginations that they're just different people are making up. Uh, you've got this one actually comes up out of the ground, just like the, the locusts of Revelation. They come right up out of the ground. And of course, you've got the red light coming up from underneath it. The red light is there, not because it's coming up out of hell or anything, but because the red light symbolizes the changeover. It, it symbolizes the plasma. So yeah, you can totally see that, you know, they all share this similar type. Now, I think that they're actually tinted red there because of all the blood. But it it might be that these particular phantasoids, they've got this sort of slimy type look to them. I believe that they share a lot of traits with much of our sea creatures and our sea life. Here, let me go back over to the live, live scene here. So I believe that they share a lot of characteristics with our sea creatures. Like uh, many sea creatures, they can live for a long time or they can actually change their uh, chemistries. They can change color, like the octopus and stuff like that. They can just instantly change color to match their surroundings, just like the Predator. The Predator, if you've ever seen the movie, there's a movie called The Predator, okay? Alien fights the Predator and everything. The Predator has this sort of camouflage. He just turns invisible. He matches the same color as his surroundings. That is a chameleon-like effect much the same as an octopus, you know, there are these creatures that can change their color and change what they look like, essentially. Um, so why, what's stopping the phantasoids from being able to change their colors as well? They can also change their colors. And so this probably gives credence to the shapeshifters of the alien communities. You know, the alien communities, they talk about the insectoids, phantasoids match the description. The alien communities talk about the shapeshifters. Phantasoids can possibly also shapeshift or change their, you know, their colors and stuff like that, just like chameleons do. All right, let's see what else we got to talk about here. We talked about the types, the classes, the different names for phantasoids. We've talked about the knights fighting the snails for some reason in ancient times uh, and why that's absolutely symbolic. I mean, not symbolic, that's literal. They were literally fighting giant snails or what people drew and described as gigantic snails, gigant gigantic insects, insectoids, okay? They're the phantasoids. Uh, we talked about the, all the love, death, and robots examples. Highly recommend checking out that show. 
uh, and that the fact that they can possibly change their colors, right? They can possibly change colors and stuff and try to blend in. I mean, I would assume they would do that if they had that ability. If man is humanity is out there trying to like, you know, sending all their knights against them to go fight the dragons and stuff. If they can change colors, I'll bet you they're going to chameleon into, you know, they're going to go into hiding. Which also might actually give rise and credence to real monsters like Loch Ness or Bigfoot or these other uh, cryptids. I, I, I use that term loosely because I don't like the word cryptid that much um, because I believe that they are there's phantasoids and then there are, are other things. Okay, phantasoids for me are a class of their own. But you know maybe beings that we describe like the Yeti. Or, uh, you know, which also has white hair and is a giant creature of some sort. Um, or Loch Ness and stuff. You know, these beings might be able to breathe water. They might, ha they might have a different type of, you know, breathing system. They could probably breathe air for a limited time or for extended periods of time. But maybe they like to breathe water, you know. Um, but yeah, that could give rise to Loch Ness and all these things. Those are the phantasoids that survived because they went into hiding and they have only been seen from time to time from, you know, from, from different period in history to different period in history, right? They're the survivors. And so they become our legends, our Bigfoots, our Loch Ness, etc. So what does this mean? This means that mythical monsters are real. Monsters are real. I was I grew up, you know, basically being taught, as did the rest of the world, that parents are supposed to teach their children, oh, don't be afraid, it's just a movie. Don't be afraid, monsters aren't real. That's why we can watch scary movies, because we know they're not real. That sounds to me like being blissfully ignorant of something, okay? The reason why those movies scare us is because there is truth at the core all right, there's truth to the stories of the monsters and the legends of the great beasts and everything, okay? That's why we have fantastic beasts and where you can find them, you know, because they're going to go into hiding because this is not their world, right? But this means that every single one of these movies is a form of disclosure. They are telling you the reality of your existence, okay? At some point in time, all these stories are real. There is nothing made up. There's nothing new under the sun, as it says in the Bible. Everything is the same never-ending story that's always been told from start to restart. Okay? It's just told from a different perspective, a different part of that timeline. Anything in the story that is told that's like sci-fi or artificial intelligence, uh, zombie apocalypse, that type of stuff is at the very, very, very end of the story. Yeah, depends on your perspective, but that's the very end of the story. Anything that has like the ancient mythical monsters or a fantastic avatar-like world or something, that's the very beginning of the story. That's the paradise. That's the Garden of Eden and stuff like that, right? And then in the middle, like I said, it's a pendulum. You've got less extreme stories. So now you're focusing on like the relationships of the families and the bloodlines and the survivors and, you know, how they treated one another and stuff. Like, even though to me that stuff's very boring, that's all still a part of the great story that's being told. You're a part of it. You're walking around in a story right now. We happen to be a little closer towards the rebirth part, right? Which is very exciting for me. All right, let's see what else. Uh, what else does this mean? We have got Lalo Tai. If you watch Disney's Moana, I already mentioned that, you know, we've got Lalo Tai, the realm of the monsters. They go down through the water, fall into another world where there are these gigantic, strange looking beasts, right? Filled with the phantasoids, basically. Uh, we also have the stories of people living inside of whales. Why are people living inside of whales, right? Yes, it could be a whale, or it could be what whale means, which is monster, which aka phantasoid, right? Not just living inside of whales, but living inside of a whale in order to survive or to get somewhere, okay? This is where I'm going with that, right? It may be possible because of the exoskeleton of some of these animals that you might be able to go inside of them I'm just speculating, okay, but perhaps some people at some point during this wonderful story figured out that they can get out of this world 
and survive the vacuum of space or the harshness of whatever environments out there by going inside of one of these phantasoids. Maybe they didn't have rockets. Maybe they didn't have the greatest uh, doomsday preppers in the world, NASA, in order to build all these spaceships to get ready for the big event. Maybe they said, hey, we can jump inside of this space whale, this phantasoid that has this impenetrable armor, and we can get sucked up when they all get sucked up, and we can leave this place. I'm just speculating. I'm just, you know, it makes sense to me, though. But you've got the stories of Jonah and the great whale in the Bible, right? Jonah and the monster. He lives inside of it for three days, right? And then we've got uh, Pinocchio, of course. Pinocchio literally goes inside of a whale whose name is Monster or Monstro, okay? That is, there's, there's, that's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Monstro is called that because he is one of the... He's one of the Phantasoids, basically. So we've got Jonah, Pinocchio, and Harry Mudd from Star Trek. If you're a Star Trek fan, you know that Harry Mudd is a character. He got onto the Enterprise, or onto uh, the Discovery, which is a spaceship, right? Be he survived space by going inside of this space whale, and that's how he ended up surviving the, you know, the conditions of space, because the space whales are able to endure those connections. Harry Mudd just goes inside of one, and he travels to wherever he's going and then he just comes out of it, you know? So maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something to those stories of people traveling and living inside of these giant whales or monsters or uh, phantasoids. We also have the sacred white animals. We talked about that and how they represent the return of uh, the magic, the return of magic to our world. That's what this is going to be. The world's going to become a very magical place. That's the direction we're going to go in after... Uh, the pendulum swings to the very bottom. The world's going to be magical. Uh, people are going to have abilities, powers, telepathy. They'll be able to move things with your head, with your mind. Uh, it's going to be an entirely different place. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a fantastic wonderland in comparison to what it is now. We will enter into a red sky, okay? The red sky is an indicator of mysterious things happening, of sometimes scary things, of magical things, of mysterious, you know what I mean? That's what the red sky means. The blue sky is very, you know, it's very full of light. There's not a lot of mystery there. There's no magic, really. That's the time we live in. Magic has been all but stripped away from this world, right? It needs a refill. It's going to get a refill because we go through these fluxes of magical to non-magical. Right now, we're at the bottom of the non-magical phase. Not that there isn't magic. It's just not as much and it's not as powerful as it used to be. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we talked about the uh, white animals, the return of the magical. For example, uh, if you look at the movie The Neverending Story, Falcor is a phantasoid. He's a friendly animal class or Chimera class, Phantasoid, because he looks like a dragon, and he also looks like a lizard, and he also looks like a dog, you know what I mean? He's a Chimera class, or a, an, an animal class, Phantasoid. Um, as a matter of fact, that whole movie, The Neverending Story, is exactly what we're talking about. That's real. That whole movie is real. It's not fiction. It's not made up. It's a real story. It's a true story. As a matter of fact, it's the only story, okay? But yeah, you, there's a lot of different Phantasoids in that movie alone. They actually have a giant snail in the movie, that's this racing snail. The guy rides on top of it. You're going to see movies starting to come out like Ant-Man, uh, the next Ant-Man, I believe, uh, or the whatever it is, the next you know Marvel thing. They've got Ant-Man riding on a tardigrade. Like I said, some of these phantasoids could actually work with humans. Some are benevolent. Some could be tamed. Many of them could not. All right. But anyhow, uh, let's see here. Oh, you know what? I want to address the movie. A Quiet Place. Boom, we're going to do some screen sharing. I've pulled up some various images for A Quiet Place. One thing that you will notice that they all have in common is the color red, right? In the movie, I've got a whole list of them, but you can see right here, they've got these lights, right? The string of lights here. These are the red lights that they turn on, which means danger, which means the phantasoids are here. That's what it means in the movie. That's their symbol. That's, 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 that is a symbol of them saying, hey, the red lights turn on, the phantasoids are here. That's the red sky symbolism, basically. But I wrote down a lot of stuff. Uh, 
I watched the movie A Quiet Place, and it's got a lot of plasma apocalypse symbolism, as well as the whole movie is about phantasoids. The whole movie is about living during the time after everything has already been sucked up into the sky, and the phantasoids are now here among us, okay? So let's look at this, because I believe this movie is spot on when it talks about cer a certain class of the phantasoids, and that would be the hunter class, all right? The eaters. So first of all, we've got the locust class phantasoids with their exoskeletal, uh, you know, type of a body. They're very pale type of a body with a sort of slimy, shiny look to them. They also have the face that opens up. That's another uh, commonality that we find amongst the phantasoids, at least amongst that particular class. They have a type of face that is able to open up in order to devour their prey or whatever it's used for. I assume it's to eat stuff, right? Oh, the phantasoids have a frequency sensitivity right? So they're very sensitive to certain sounds or certain frequencies, exactly like in the movie they live, how the alien shapeshifter beings could be seen whenever a certain frequency was implemented, right? In this movie, A Quiet Place, uh, the frequency, certain frequencies would really disrupt their sense of hearing and it would sort of drive them insane and allow the humans to kill them. <clears throat> also kind of reminds me of like, uh, the works of David Icke, how he talks about like the reptilians are sensitive to certain frequencies and stuff like that, as well as um, uh, the teachings of uh, Don Juan uh, by Carlos Castaneda. He talks about how like those beings, those those uh, reptilian type beings, they're they're sensitive to certain frequencies, right? Now the movie is telling us that the phantasoids, at least so some of them, may be very sensitive to sound or they also might be blind. They might not be able to see in this world, okay? They might have a different, you know, they, they might be able to see differently where they're from. Here's another thing, okay? This whole movie is about being quiet. Throughout the whole movie, they do this. This is the, the symbol for a secret. That means, uh, don't tell anybody. That means this is a secret, okay? So the whole, throughout the whole movie, they're doing this, but it's just saying, hey, this is a secret. We're telling you a secret, okay? They're also saying to be quiet, right? Uh, the whole thing is like, don't talk. Don't basically speak no evil, right? Don't talk because the phantasoids will get you, okay? So I believe that um, movies are coming out like this. Uh, you also have Bird Box. Bird Box was not speak no evil, but Bird Box was see no evil. They had the whole blindfolds and everything, right? That means when the plasma comes, don't stand around looking at it. Don't stand around looking at all the phantasoids and stuff. Like, get away from the evil. Don't hang out and watch it like it's a fireworks show or it's entertainment or television. Get away. See no evil, okay? Get out of the, get out of the area. Um, Speak no evil, okay? Be quiet because the, the phantasoids will be able to hear you and that's how they'll know where you are. That's how the movie portrays them. I'm just saying, okay? And it looks like it's describing the same type of thing. You have to be very quiet because in this world, the phantasoids can hear you. And you know what? It might also be possible that during the, when the world depressurizes, first of all, you're going to have a lot of nosebleeds because of, you know, the instant depressurization, some people's ears are going to bleed as well. And a lot of people are going to lose their hearing, ho hopefully just temporarily, okay? But maybe some people, it might affect you permanently. I don't know. But it's a good chance that you're, you're going to lose your hearing at least for a time. It could be the same amount of time that the phantasoids are here. <laughs> so that, that could be why what the movie's all about, right? They actually have a deaf girl in the movie who cannot hear she's deaf so the world depressurizes the air turns into fog or mist you start bleeding from the nose uh you can't hear everything goes deafly quiet or according to the bible it says there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour so this concept of being quiet and there being silence along with the fog and the fog monsters and the phantasoids and the red sky it's all here so anyways that's the movie a quiet place <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Let's go back to uh, the live scene here so you can get some more pictures. So this is one reason, one excellent reason. I've never liked seafood. Okay, I don't like crab. I don't like lobsters. Basically, I am not interested in eating anything that could be related to the phantasoids. 
aka the visitors from outer space, aka the godlike creatures, or whatever you would like to call them, angels, all this stuff, okay? It seems to me that when the Phanazoids drop down and enter into our world or come up from above, not all of them die. Some of them have children, okay? They have uh, babies. Those babies are born into a microcosm. All right, their parents come from the macrocosm, but the babies are born in the microcosm, which means they grow to a size that fits their world. Which means that by extension, all these weird, strange, alien looking sea creatures that we have are possibly direct descendants of earlier phantozoids that have come and gone. That when we see these weird crab beings underwater and we see these huge lobsters and these weird things with exoskeletons and stuff, that those are direct descendants and the family line of the monsters from above, of the phantozoids, right? Which, it, for me, perfectly explains why they have so much in common already, right? So yes, they could be related. Uh, they could have eggs. They could lay eggs. And who knows how long those eggs will, will be dormant for. You know, maybe those eggs hatch after a certain amount of time and the kaiju class come up out of the waters. Now you've got truth in the movie Godzilla. We understand where all this stuff in Godzilla is coming from now, right? Uh, let's see. How about, I want to talk about touching the mythical creatures. Okay? Like that. Please do not rush out just because you see some chimera class phanazoid that looks like a unicorn and you're just going all starry eyed over the unicorn or whatever. Don't run out and just start petting it and touching it, okay? Take your time. Hopefully we'll be able to communicate telepathically so that we can actually talk to these creatures in some sort of a way. But don't run out and just start touching the, the monsters, all right? That's not a good idea. First of all, even if they're benevolent, you don't know what kind of a sickness that they could possibly have. You don't know if they have something on them that's not benevolent. You know what I mean? So it's not a good idea to just rush out and start making wishes and touching stuff, okay? I highly advise against that. Not only that, but obviously you have friendlies, you have neutrals, and you have the eater class or the hunters, right? You don't want to just rush out and start touching them, even though you see some that look like Falcor, or you see some that look like, you know, the that one from Avatar, you know, the, the white buffalo flying deal. I forgot, I forgot what it's called. But yeah, let's not touch the Phanazoids, okay? At least for a while. Give it some time, get to know them, talk to them, see what's going on. But you don't know. They could have a sickness that might turn you, you know, they could carry some sort of a... a, a, a like a bacteria or virus or something that could change your actual physical structure. You could end up looking like the thing, you know, like in the movie, the thing, basically the, it's a phanazoid sickness that, that gets inside of people. It's a virus that gets inside of people and it grows into this worm like creature and it's living inside of the human body until finally the human body can't take it anymore. And like the creature just bursts out of it. That's the movie called the thing. Okay. Super creepy, super scary. I would rather fight the, you know, the uh, the hunter class phanazoids than to like get bit by one of these infected ones or something and end up like a werewolf or turn into like the thing or some god awful, who knows, right? Just don't touch them. Not a good idea. Take your time, okay? You don't want to catch some crazy space disease. All right, let's see. We're wrapping things up here. Uh, before we go, I want to talk about. I talk about like certain movies, okay? Now here's the deal. If it was just one movie, if it was just one movie, like if it was just A Quiet Place and there were no examples of the Phanazoids, the Red Sky, the Fog Monsters, all this stuff, if that wasn't in any other movie and I just went off of one movie, people would be like, yeah, okay, whatever you say, buddy, right? But it's all of them, see? How they have that guy in the fog right there? That's all the movies, okay? These, all these movies, it's just like, it's just like comparative mythology. When we compare all of the myths and the legends, you can do the same thing with movies and television, which is one of the things that I do, okay? Some people would say, well, it's just your imagination. Other people would say, huh, it is quite a striking uh, similarity that all of these movies have the same concepts in common. They have the same things that are reappearing time and time again, right? That's because we acknowledge 
that we are all part of one story. You can't make a part of it up. You can't create something brand new that exists outside of this story because getting a little deeper into things, that's a part of the fractal verse. That's a part of the hologram that we live in. It's all coded. Okay. You can't come up with something new inside of what's already been established. Anyhow, it's not just one movie. It's all of them. And one of these days I'm going to make them, I'm going to make a little video of me on Netflix, just going from movie to movie telling you this is all part of the same story. Okay. Just as, just like how they have the, uh, Pixar theory. I don't know how many people have seen, but they've got the Pixar theory and that's, uh, basically all the Pixar movies are along the same timeline. That's every single movie that exists in what we call reality. Those that that's all one big Pixar theory. Okay. All these movies. That's why I'm showing you all these clips. They're all a part of the same never ending story that we are a part of. Okay. It's all the Pixar theory. They're all related. As a matter of fact, in my next video, I'm going to be talking about how zombies will walk. There will be a zombie apocalypse and uh, we are going to have artificial intelligence that becomes sentient. Okay. Ro robots, all that stuff's going to become sentient. But it's all a part of the big, huge story, okay? Last but not least, not all monsters are phantasoids. I want to make that very clear because I know a lot of people are going to come to me, look, I found a phantasoid, and show me a picture of like Frankenstein or something, okay? I guess you could probably say that vampires are the bipedal phantasoids, okay? Because the gods come from the sky. So yes, I guess you could, probably could make an argument for that. But not all monsters are phantasoids, okay? So when you look at you know, each individual monster, you want to consider like where it's from and where it's got its, uh, its origins and stuff like that. But a lot of monsters are phantasoids and they encompass all these various classes. Uh, I'll just mention the classes one more time. So first we've got three types, friendly, neutral, and eaters. Then you've got your classes. You've got your bug class phantasoid, the locust class, kaiju class, worm class, creature class, and bipedal class. Oh, how long are they here for? Well, the Bible says that the uh, locust class is going to be here for about five months. All right, so it's really not that long. Like I said, they're out of their element. This isn't their home. They don't know what to eat. You know, they're they're gonna they're gonna be trying to survive, and they're not going to for very long. Um, biblically speaking, about five months or so. Okay, like I said. Tradition holds that the knights of old, the men of renown, the heroes, they went out and they actually, they sought out notoriety by trying to kill these unkillable beasts. Um, and so they all died off basically, right? They end up, the surviving ones end up being rumors of rumors like the Loch Ness monster and stuff. So yeah, they're out of their natural environment. So they're not going to last very long. Surviving phantasoids may find shelter and protection near the sea bottom within the earth or other hard to reach places, right? And then as hard to believe as it is, the people of this realm will forget all about them. Their encounters will become stories and legends and myths once again. To sum up this entire video, hear no evil. This is the depressurization. You're not going to be able to hear the van the phantasoids, okay? A lot of people are going to go deaf at least for a small amount of time because of the depressurization of our world. Noses are going to bleed. Some people are going to bleed out of the ears and a lot of people are not going to have very good hearing for quite some time. See no evil. Do not look at the deadlights. Learn your lesson from Lot's wife, the biblical Lot, the character Lot. He was instructed, don't look back at the destruction. His wife looks back and she becomes petrified. She turns into stone. Don't hang out in awe of all the mythical creatures that are all around you all of a sudden. Get away. Okay, go find safety. This is a time of survival, not a time of frolicking about naked with all of the phantasoids or whatever. Okay, you can. Believe me, you can. Some people probably will. All the more power to you. Speak no evil. Be quiet and cautious until the phantasoids die out, okay? Be mindful about what's happening in the new world that you live in. All right, with that being said, let me see. Let me check my notes. Anything else? 
Oh, I do want to thank all of the members, uh, all the people who are signing up as a member here on my channel. Uh, you do get some fun emojis to play with, as well as a little loyalty badge there in the chat room. I'm thankful for every single one of you guys. I look forward to uh, tonight's, uh, well, I look forward to the Sylvan Lining segment that I do every Tuesday with all of you. And I just want to say thank you to all of my supporters uh, the people who joined as members, all the people who are signing up on the website, all the viewers, all the people who like and share my videos, even though I don't even ask you to. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. It actually inspires me to push forward, to keep going, and to continue putting out you know more ideas that I come up with, that I have, and sharing my experiences. Uh, and I want to thank my PayPal and Patreon supporters as well. With that being said, until next time, Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, go check out my Plasma Apocalypse playlist where I talk about uh, getting sucked up into the sky. I talk about the Phantazoids. I talk about the mechanics and what happens. I talk about all the plasma tentacles coming down into our world and what they do. Um, very interesting information on my Plasma Apocalypse playlist. And uh, I encourage everyone to please leave a constructive comment if you have something to add to the discussion. Leave it in the comments section. I go over it and I learn a lot from you. So I can't imagine what other people learn as well. With that being said, I just want to say thanks for watching. Until next time, I am Jay Dreamers saying good vibes and goodbye. I did record a little thing I want to show I want to show you guys on my website if you have examples of phanazoids and you'd like to post your pictures or video clips or whatever um, you can go ahead and check out this clip that I'm gonna play right now and it's gonna show you exactly how to get to my website uh, sign up go into the forum and then you're going to in the forum there's a plasma apocalypse section under the plasma apocalypse section there is a phantasoid section where you can post your examples of phantasoids ask questions talk all about phantasoids